So when we, when we look at uh, a passage from Scripture to preach, we usually are looking at what is the trouble in the text and where is the grace in the text. And so that's the model I want to use today for a little bit of conversation about this story. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is the trouble in the text the trouble. So, over on this side of the congregation, what kinds of things did you hear in that story that Bob read that made you think that there was some kind of problem? That they wanted to arrest Jesus, right. Who wanted Jesus arrested? The Pharisees, the, the leaders of the Jewish people in the temple. What else? Why, why did they want him arrested? What was, he, what, was he, what was Jesus saying? What has he been preaching and doing that leads people to a conclusion about who he is? She's fine. She's fine. Any idea? What did Jesus say last week about who he is? He said, I am the bread of heaven. So, He's making a profound claim about himself there, isn't he? Okay, so I'm just going to tell you what, what I was hoping you'd hear, all right? So there are several problems in this text. There's some real trouble in this text. Jesus has been making statements and doing signs, all of which point to who he is as the Son of God. All these signs, all of his teachings in the Gospel of John are pointing to one thing, that he is the Messiah that the people have been waiting for. They don't need to wait any longer. He is here. Everything has changed. But the people who are running the temple, those, those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, those people who have a very specific idea of what the Messiah is going to look like and what he's going to do when he gets here, they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not what we expected. How dare you claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God? That is heresy. And in the ancient world, the punishment for heresy was death on a cross. And so the trouble in the text, I think, revolves around primarily two things. The first one is this conversation about this, the identity of Jesus. Could he possibly be who he says he is? And did you hear, what is their main objection about him saying he's the Messiah? Where he's from? Could anything good come out of Galilee? Yeah. They didn't read their Bible very well because Scripture says that eventually they would be able to trace the Messiah back to Galilee. But that's all right. We'll give them a, a pass on that one. So this, this Scripture, as the whole Gospel of John does, focuses and centers us on this question of who is Jesus? Who is he? And what does he do in this world that is so radical that it turns everything upside down and gets some people really ticked off? Which leads us to the second point that I want us to pay attention to in terms of the trouble in the text. That these these religious leaders who are running the temple system and benefiting from it very nicely, by the way, they are so sure that what they think is the truth that they can't hear anything else. They can't see beyond their preconceptions, their own reality that they've built around what they think is going to happen when the Messiah comes. And Jesus isn't, is not meeting their expectations. So what do they do? They say, arrest him, silence him. The people are listening to him. He's a rabble rouser and a heretic. He needs to be silenced. So that's kind of a summation of the trouble in this text. It's all about people 
wanting to know who Jesus is, but being utterly confused because he's not acting or doing the things that they were sure, they were sure the Messiah was going to do when he came. Okay, so now let's look at trouble in the world. Hmm, can we even begin to imagine in our world right now that people are so sure that they are right that they won't listen to anybody else? Imagine that. Can we imagine that in our world, in our country, that the vast majority of people say, Jesus? I don't need Jesus. I'm doing just fine, just the way I am. Imagine that. You hear it every day, don't you? We see it. We hear it. We have friends who think we're crazy to be giving our lives over to this, this man named Jesus. What other trouble along these lines do you see in the world today? And anybody have any ideas? Division, and there was certainly division going on in this story. So that leads us to something else. What happens when a group of people or even an individual is so sure that they are right and everyone else is wrong? What happens then? They become blind, blind. right, blind. I wonder how easy it would be for us to sit here today and already be thinking in our minds about who we think is so sure they're right, and yet maybe we're doing the exact same thing. Interesting. So division happens when you've got one group of people who's sure that they are right and another group of people who's sure that they are right and the ability to communicate with each other, to listen to each other, to engage each other seems to have just disappeared, doesn't it? And so we, we are living in this constant state of anxiety and conflict and and degradation of relationships. What, what, what happened to, to the gift of having two ears and one mouth where we can listen more than we speak? What happened to being able to be open to listening to another point of view without assuming that they're wrong and we're right? I think that the truth is that the world that Jesus was living in was not that different from the world that you and I find ourselves living in, where certitude seems to be something that we all should be working for, and once we're sure of what's right, then it's very easy for us to say, well, whoever doesn't believe what I believe is wrong. Okay. So now let's look at where we see grace in the text. This side of the, of the sanctuary. Where did you see grace in the text? Eileen? And who was that person who stood up? Nicodemus. We met Nicodemus a few weeks ago, didn't we? Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He is a highly educated teacher of the law. He knows the Jewish law. He is convinced that the way to be in right relationship with God is exactly what they've been taught by obedience to the law. And he teaches that, and he enforces it, and yet... Here comes Jesus who says, wait a minute, that's the old covenant. I am bringing something brand new into your world, something brand new and alive into your life. Because no longer will you be in relationship with God through obedience to a law. Now you have the gift of relationship with God through your relationship with God me. It's as simple as that. 
Jesus is not saying we can ignore the law, the love God and love your neighbor as yourself law. No, we are even more equipped to live out God's law of love when we understand that it's not through blind obedience to a bunch of laws that makes God love us. It's when we say yes to God's relationship through Jesus' invitation. When Jesus says, come and let me feed you. Come and let me quench your thirst. That's when real life begins. Any other, th any other thoughts about what you heard in the text about grace? Go ahead, Barb. Yes. Yes, thank you. The gift is for everyone. Well, now there's a radical idea. You mean for people who don't think like we do, Jesus loves them? Yes. You mean for people who believe differently than we do, Jesus loves them? Yes. You mean for people who don't even believe, really believe that there is a God and that God matters in their lives, that Jesus loves them? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. And you know, this very, I guess we could move to the next slide now, um, this very observation that God's gift of love and grace and eternal life is for everyone really ticks some people off. Because <laughs> there are still a lot of Pharisees in this world. We all know some. Sometimes we are Pharisees too. When we simply cannot abide a different way of thinking, when we pass judgment on each other because someone doesn't believe what we believe. And that's, that's trouble. But as Barb points out, this gift of, of bread, of living water, is for everyone. Not once does Jesus put any kind of boundary around the kingdom of God. So, where do we find grace in today's world? Where do you find grace in today's world? Where do you find love, God's abundant, eternal, unconditional love? Family, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, not always. <laughs> Barb? Sleep in Heavenly Peace Project, even when someone delivering the bed falls flat on her face on the ice, and today her knee is all swollen, but she's here. Yes, Sleep in Heavenly Peace, a great example. Uh, Matthew's Table, Goodness Project, all those, all those groups of people who have seen a need in the world and step outside of their own comfort zones, um, and just because all they want to do is just meet that need. And why do we do those kinds of things? Does it, does it make us better people? No. Why do we do those things? Because we're loving our neighbor just like God first loves us. Any other examples of where you experience grace in this world? Here. Okay, wonderful. Here where we come week after week after week to be with family. Here we come where we can bring whoever we are and whatever garbage has gone on in our lives throughout the week and just bring it here and just let it be. Here we, we see water poured and baptism happening. Here we are fed with the body and blood of Jesus week after week after week because we need that gift, don't we? So here's what I think is the... Is the challenge for us today. I think that this text, that this story is asking us to do a reality check. Like, what is our reality? Because the truth is, we live in the two kingdoms. If you picture yourself standing on two different, in two different circles, though on the one hand, we live in the kingdom of this world, where God is present, but we are broken. Would you agree with me? But at the same time, we live 
in the kingdom of God. We live in the kingdom of God because God has claimed us before we were even born and promised to love us no matter what and gives us eternal life to enjoy both now and in some distant place in God's heart in the future. We have feet in both worlds, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. Is that a comfortable place to be? Not always, not even usually. So the question that that I want us to think about from today is which of the two realities do we lean more into? And I think the answer is probably, well, pastor, depends on the day and the hour and, (laughs) and the minute, right? Because sometimes we are leaning more into the kingdom of this world for whatever reason. Maybe it's temptation, and we're hoping God's not looking for a minute. Maybe it's just stress, and we just can't quite access the life that Jesus promises us that might help us feel better. And so we lean into that kingdom of the world far. But some days, some moments, we are leaning more into the kingdom of God. And when we're leaning more into the kingdom of God, we are open to hearing God speaking to us through Scripture, through other people, even those, maybe especially those who are different from us or who disagree with us or whose reality is different from ours. And sometimes we lean a little bit towards the kingdom of God. And some days, the best days, those days when we feel as if life is abundant beyond description, we are leaning way into that kingdom. But the truth is, we have feet in both kingdoms. And so what is your reality? Which of those kingdoms is truer for you? on an average day in your life. And if your honest appraisal is that oftentimes you find yourself leaning more into the kingdom of this world, which is a gift from God, what would it take for you to maybe become a little bit more evenly balanced and maybe even be able to lean a bit further into the kingdom of God? Because we each do have our own sense of reality, don't we? We each have our own, our own life that we're living. Even if we're living with someone who we dearly love, we're each individuals having our own experience. And we're each hearing the word of God a little bit differently. And we're each faced with challenges every day of our lives. We each hear voices that are calling us and telling us, we don't need God. We don't need Jesus. We're doing just fine the way we are until the bottom falls out. And then we're crying out, God, where have you been? The the living water, the bread from heaven that Jesus wants to be for us, wants to fill us up to overflowing every day of our lives so that we can be strengthened and encouraged so that our faith can grow and so that we never again find ourselves like those Pharisees, putting boundaries around the love of God, judging people who believe differently from us or those who don't believe at all so that we can remember and believe that God loves them too, that We are all equally saints and sinners before God. And that when we look at the cross, when we think about the meaning of that event and that symbol, that we can recognize that that is exactly where Jesus leads us, to the cross. Not so that we can feel guilt-ridden or or feel like we're about to be punished, but so that we can see in that symbol the greatest, the greatest image of God's love that has ever been known in this world. Because the truth is, the true reality is 
that God loves you. God created you exactly the way you are and loves you for your good days and loves you on your bad days. And that Jesus has made a profound covenant with you, a promise to you, that no matter where your journey takes you on any given day, whether you're leaning more into the kingdom of this world or more into the kingdom of God, that he is right there with you, as close as your breath, loving you through whatever you're going through, encouraging you to hear him speaking to you, and reminding each one of us of his command. It's not a suggestion, it's a command that each and every moment of each and every day, all that matters is that we love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And that is a reality that we can live with. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>